So sometimes we want to ask God why. Sometimes we want to question God. When we see things going on in our lives or we see things going on in the world, it seems like bad things are happening to good people. It seems like good things are happening to bad people. And it just seems like everything is upside down and the whole world is in chaos. And on the surface, it seems like questioning God is the wrong approach. But I want to submit to you that actually questioning God is an act of faith. Taking your questions to God is a sign that you believe that God has the answers. And that's the perfect approach. Habakkuk, in today's text, is asking God this very question. He's asking God why. And we're going to explore that dialogue between him and God. And the only thing I want to submit to you <laughs> is that if you ask God why, you better be ready to receive the answer. The book of Habakkuk is categorized as a minor prophet. And as we always say, minor doesn't necessarily mean less significant. It just means that it's a shorter book. Uh, the book of Habakkuk is just three chapters. We studied the book of Haggai a few weeks ago. That's just two chapters, minor prophet. Micah, we studied last week, seven chapters. And then you contrast that maybe to a book like Jeremiah, that's 52 chapters, major prophet. So you've got the distinction between major and minor right there. But it certainly doesn't mean that their ministries were any less significant. They certainly gave very profound, very important insight as to what God was doing within the people of God at this day and time. And even some of them gave prophetic words that have yet to come to pass. So very, very important information. I think what's amazing when we have 12 minor prophets and five major prophets, it just shows that God uses everybody. God has the ability to use any and everybody, all the prophets, very diverse people from all different walks of life. You know, some served right up under kings and then some were just working class people. But God gave prophetic utterances to all different types of people. And I think that that's pretty amazing. So when we look at the prophet Habakkuk, it is estimated that his ministry spans somewhere between 612 B.C. and 586 B.C. We don't know the exact date and times when his ministry started and began uh, just because unlike other prophets <laughs> he, he didn't time stamp his prophecies you know uh, Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died so we know a point of reference for that prophecy and then Haggai went so far as to give the month and the day of his prophecies so we knew exactly when those four prophecies took place in the book of Haggai we don't have that luxury in the book of Habakkuk but if you look in the first chapter of the book of Habakkuk, he is prophesying the invasion of the Chaldeans. So we know that the first campaign that the Chaldeans uh, leveraged against uh, the people of Judah was in 605 BC. We know that they did three campaigns beginning in 605 BC and then ending in 586 BC with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. So we know that at least this prophecy predates then. So we estimate somewhere around 612 BC to 586 BC. Um, what's unique about Habakkuk in contrast to other prophecies is that other prophets, God spoke to the prophet and then the prophet in turn would speak to the people. But this situation is reversed. Habakkuk is going to God on behalf of the people and what we're seeing really in this book is we're seeing a dialogue between God and Habakkuk and him going to God and trying to get answers from God, trying to get clarity from God. He is he is prompting this conversation with God. So we 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 have to ask what what was the conversation about or or why is Habakkuk going to God? Well, if you see in the opening parts of the book of Habakkuk in chapter number one, he is questioning why are the wicked prospering? He, he's praying to God and he's asking God, he's saying that there are so many injustices going on right now. You have people that are being mistreated that deserve to be treated better. And you have people that are carrying on in a wicked way and they're still being blessed behind it. And it's interesting because this conversation and this questioning that Habakkuk has, it's very reminiscent of Asaph in the 73rd Psalm. Asaph said, he said, my foot almost slipped 
when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph, just like Habakkuk, had the same question. He's like, why are the, are, is good happening to wicked people? And this is this is a, a bit of a recurring theme that we saw with, with even with other prophets. You, you had the prophet Amos who would have served in the northern kingdom. And if you read in the book, uh, Amos took some discrepancies to God and questioned God as well about some of the injustices going on. I did write down one verse in Amos chapter 5, verse 12. He said, For I know your manifold transgression and your mighty sins. They afflict the just, they take bribe, and they turn aside the poor in the gate from their right. So it's it's talking about how you have wealthy people and people in power who are taking advantage of the disenfranchised. And these aren't people from outside of, of the Jews. These, these aren't people from outside of the people of God. These, these are Jews mistreating other Jews. And what you're having is you're having seasons of prosperity to where it's it's causing a separation in economic classes. And those who are in position of power are taking advantage of, of those in, in less power. And, it, and it's causing a lot of questions because you have to understand the relationship that that uh, Israel and Judah had with God is that if they obeyed God, God would bless them. You go back and you read Deuteronomy 28, the, 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 they were in a very clear barter system with God that if they were clear to obey God, then they would be blessed. But if they disobeyed God, then that would result in punishment. And now we have people that are asking God, like, wait a minute, these people are, we have people that are disobeying you, but it seems like they're still, they're still blessed. And that's how, that's how Habakkuk chapter one opens up in verse number four. He says, the wicked does compass about the righteous. The wicked is all around the righteous. And it says, therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. It, it's saying, he's saying that the world is unjust. He's saying, God, God, where is the justice? Where, where is the execution of your judgment? God, you're, you're not doing what we hoped you would do. But then God responds. So in Habakkuk chapter one, starting at verse number five, God begins to give his response. And he's saying, no, I see what's going on. And I have every intention of responding. As a matter of fact, in verse number six, he said, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. So God begins to explain to Habakkuk that there are these people that I am going to use in a sense as my rod of correction. I'm gonna use it as my wooden spoon to, to, to chastise the people of Judah and let them know that I'm not gonna let wickedness go unpunished. Now, what's interesting is who God is using because you would expect that if God is gonna use a people to chastise unrighteousness, that he would use a righteous people. Not so. <laughs> the, the, the verses, the, the, the book goes on to explain the character of the Chaldeans in, in, in detail. And it says that they're bitter and they're hasty. It says they're terrible and they're dreadful. It says that they're fierce warriors and extremely violent. It talks about how fast their horses are. And it just talks about just how violent they are and how they go about trying to trying to conquer nation after nation and they're they're pretty much just going around trying to conquer everything because they have an insatiable lust for power they have an insatiable desire to just to just to just it, it's all just driven by pride driven by ego they just want to conquer everything it says that they're a proud people they're an immoral people and they're a pagan people they worship false gods and so this, these are the people that God is choosing to use to correct Judah. So now Habakkuk has another question. And at the, at the latter part of chapter number one, Habakkuk turns around and he's saying, wait, God, how are you going to use an even more wicked people to punish the wicked? Again, he's, he's questioning the logic of God, the justice of God. He's like, God, how, how are you going to do this? In, in Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, verse 13, he says, The wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous. Now, he didn't say that he was right, but he's saying he's more, he said, We're more righteous than the Chaldeans. How are you going to use them to punish us? So, so he's questioning God. So the, the, that, that concludes the first chapter. Then we get to chapter 2. 
and God begins to speak to Habakkuk all over again. And he tell him, he starts to tell him, look, right now what I'm telling you, we're going to get into that in our lesson. He says, write down this vision that I'm telling you because I want you to understand something. I'm going to in turn punish the Chaldeans because I do in fact judge wickedness. And uh, chapter two goes on to explain five woes, if you will, five types of judgments that God is pronouncing against the Chaldeans. He's not going to allow their wickedness to go unpunished. Uh, he says in verse number six, he says, woe to him that increases that which is not his. So he's saying the Chaldeans are just going around taking stuff that doesn't belong to them. And that is wrong. In verse number nine, it says, woe to him that coveteth in evil covetedness. In verse number 12, it says, woe to him that buildeth a town with blood. He says he's just going around slaughtering people and taking people's lives and just, just, just doing all types of wrong. In verse number 15, it says, woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. It, it, it talks about how the Chaldeans themselves were giving into drinking. They were a very drunk people. They, they lived in riotous living. They, they had a very hedonistic approach to life. Then he says they in turn uh, uh, inspire and, and push other people to participate in the same behavior. And it, call, it talks about how it pulls them into nakedness or, or open shame. So, and then it finally talks about in verse number 19, it says, woe unto him that saith to the wood awake. This is talking about graven images in Habakkuk 2 and 19. And it's saying that the, the Chaldeans are in fact a paper, pagan people and they worship false gods. So God is letting Habakkuk know like, look, I am going to punish the Chaldeans, but I am first going to use them to, to, punish, uh, to punish Judah. So then Habakkuk turns around in verse number uh, in chapter three and Habakkuk responds to God in in prayer. He responds to God with a posture that says, I receive this. I, I, I understand now, you know, and the, and the justice of God is, is right. And we're going to read some verses out of chapter number three. But the book of Habakkuk is very interesting because it's showing the progression of Habakkuk going from a place to where he's questioning God, gets an answer, question God again, gets an answer. And then finally, his, his heart is settled on, on what God is speaking. And it really gives us a very good paradigm as believers, even today, that when we have questions to, for God, it's okay to take those questions to the Lord. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I will answer when I'm reproved. In verse number one, Habakkuk is referring to himself as a watchman. And this is a recurring theme that we saw in the Old Testament. Some of the prophets would refer to themselves as watchmen. Ezekiel did it. Isaiah referred to himself as a watchman. And here in verse number one, when Habakkuk is saying that he's a watchman, understand he is illustrating his posture towards God. And it, it is a positive posture. It is a positive connotation saying that he is looking to receive an answer from God, which I think is, which I think is really important. Watchmen in biblical times had a responsibility of being in watchtowers that were strategically placed throughout a region. A lot of times they would be in along the wall, along the defensive wall of a city, but sometimes they would just be, you'd have just random outposts that were watchtowers. And what did the watchmen do? Well, they would, they would look out for upcoming events and they would report back those events to concerned entrants that were within the walls. So some of these events would be positive. Some of them would be negative. Some of them would be, there's a, there's an enemy coming and a watchman's job is to warn of an enemy. So, uh, and, but there were some times when you'd have a watchman that would be like over a farm or something like that. And their job is to just watch vegetation. But either way it goes, a watchman is a seer. They are an overseer. They are to report things that, that are coming. And I, and I think that that's, I think that that's critical that you understand that that's Habakkuk's posture because coming out of chapter one with him questioning God, asking God, why are the wicked prospering? Why, why don't I see your justice? Why are you using the Chaldeans to punish the people of God? You, you, you need to know, Habakkuk, where's your attitude right now? Where, where, where's your mind at? Are you mad at God? Are you, are you getting ready to walk out? You know, uh, uh, or, or, are you just humbly approaching God with reverence? And that is certainly the case, and that's what we're seeing right here. But we have to understand as believers, it is okay to ask God why. 
It, scripture tells us several places, you know, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. If any man lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. Scripture says that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You know, I love to tell people that if something is important to you, it's important to God. If something matters to you, it matters to God. If something is hurting you, then trust me, it is, it, it is on God's heart. The psalmist says that God bottles up our tears. That means every tear that we cry, that every, every time we're crying out to God and we're saying that we're in anguish and that we're hurting, God hears those prayers and that matters to God. So it's it's okay to go to God and Habakkuk is showing us the, the right posture that when you take it to God, expect to receive an answer. Ex expect that God is gonna give you something that, that is going to set you on the right path. You know, the, the position of a watchman is so critical. We have watchmen in our contemporary churches. We call them pastors, amen, because that's what they are. They, they are visionaries. They, they are seers and their responsibility is to report back the vision of God to the people of God. They, they are watchmen. And we often say that they are watchmen of our souls. They are, they, are, they, are, they are shepherds appointed. They are under shepherds of the good shepherd. Amen. So we, we have watchmen even today. I want you to understand something very critical, and this is something that we can all apply to our lives because while we're using the, 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 the figurative speech of a watchman, for us in today's Christian world, our responsibility, our place as a watchman is in the prayer closet. I want you to understand that. When, when, we're, when we're going to God to get answers, we're doing that on our knees. We're doing that through devotion. We're doing that in the position that, that we are seeking God. I'm scared of watchmen that don't have a prayer life. I'm scared of people that 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 want to stand and declare the the, the vision of God and, and the seeings of God and God didn't speak to them in prayer. How how did you get what you got from God if He didn't speak to you in prayer? Amen. I want I want you to understand that in in the seventy third Psalm in verse number seventeen, Asaph said he said until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood therein. See everything seems confusing. Nothing seems to make sense outside of the sanctuary. But when you get in God's presence, when you get into that prayer closet and scripture says, shut the door, go into God's presence and let God speak to your heart. And, 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 I, and, I, and I, we have to drive this point home because we're getting ready to turn a corner in verse number two when we're talking about writing visions. And let me tell you something, you don't have a vision unless it came from God. The only vision that is a vision to be lived out and applied is something that God spoke to you in prayer. I know we live in a very busy society. I know that these are busy times that we have and there's so much pulling at our attention and it is so tempting to just make a snap decision. We've gotta take the time to bathe our decisions in prayers. We've gotta take the time to slow life down. We gotta, we gotta resist the urge to, to participate in the hastiness and the urgency of things going on around us. Why? Because we have to we have to make sure that what we're operating on and the things that we implement in our lives are things that God has given us. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. So verse number two needs no introduction. <laughs> Definitely one of the most popular verses. In scripture, in verse number two, God is beginning to speak now, and it's a transition from verse number one where Habakkuk was speaking. Uh, verse number one in chapter two was kind of a continuation from chapter one with, with Habakkuk kind of questioning God about why the Chaldeans are being used, and then he says, but I'm going to be a watchman on the tower. Now God is speaking, and he'll continue to speak until the end of the chapter. Now God's instruction to Habakkuk was write the vision write the vision. Writing is so critical. It, it is so important that when God gives us something that we take the time to write it down. You know, m most people that have the gift of dreaming or have the gift of seeing visions through dreams, they'll keep a notepad on the nightstand <laughs> so that when they wake up from the dream, they'll, they'll write down everything that they saw in the dream because they want to keep those details, you know? And I think it's, I think that that's a practice 
that really every believer should employ. You know, anytime you go into a, a place of worship, anytime you go into devotion, you go into prayer, you, you should take something to, to take notes because anytime you're in worship, God is most definitely, he's going to speak something to you. God is always speaking. God is always revealing. He really is always giving vision. I just think it's a question is, is, is are we listening? You know, uh, but when God gives you something, I, I think it's so critical to catch every detail. I don't think that God just gives us information arbitrarily. I don't think that God gives us information for us to forget it and like we're not going to need it. You know, I think it's important to write it down, write it down. Why? Because you're going to need it down the road. You know, Paul wrote something so critical in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. He said that faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, I-N-G, not, not having heard, not past tense, not, not you hear something one time and now you just got faith, faith from here to eternity. No, the way that you have faith and that faith remains is that you have to hear it, but then you have to hear it again and you have to continue to hear it in order for you to receive faith. You know, that's why the enemy tries to keep people out of the house of God. I, I wasn't even planning on talking about that, but it just hit me right there. That's why the enemy tries to pull people out of the house of God to keep them from hearing the preach word of God. Why? Because if you don't hear the preach word of God, your faith will die. You know, some people grew up in church all their lives and heard preaching growing up. But as they got older, they pulled away from the house of God and then their faith died. And then they then they started to convince themselves. That God stuff wasn't real. No, it's real, but your faith died. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. You, you need to continually hear the word of God. And see, that's what, uh, what God is telling Habakkuk when he's telling him to write down this vision. Why? He's telling you, you're going to need this to feed your faith down the road. You're, 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 you're going to need to read this vision and to hear this vision again and again in order for your faith to remain. You know, we're going to go through challenging times as believers. Amen. Make, make no mistake. And the truth of the matter is, is that God is not going to deliver us immediately. And some things he may not take out of our lives at all. He's going to use the circumstances of our lives to bring him glory. Now, some people don't like to hear that. But that is, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that God gave Paul a thorn in his flesh. And in verse number eight, he says that he prayed to God three times to remove the thorn and God said no. So the, see, the truth is sometimes we go through experiences in our lives that are, it's going to challenge our faith. And without hearing the vision of God, without hearing the word of God, without continually feeding our faith through, the, through devotion, we're going to lose out on God. But God's word is true and his word promises. He said, listen, Paul, I'm not going to deliver you from this thorn, but please have faith that my grace is sufficient. So God said, you may not be removed from all challenging situations, but he's saying, I'm going to go with you through all, lo, I'll be with you all way. And see, that's why it's so important that when God gives vision, that word vision in Habakkuk chapter two, verse, verse two, it's revelation. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta write down the revelation of God, the, the, the foretelling of events that are to come. This is what, this is what God is, is telling Habakkuk in this. He's telling him, write the vision, take the time. You know, there, there's a very popular concept out right now called vision boards. <laughs> and, and it's exciting and it's a little bit concerning at the same time. And I'll tell you why. Because most of the time when I talk to people and they tell me about vision boards, it doesn't sound like a vision board. It, it sounds like, and excuse me for saying this, it sounds like a lust board. It sounds like it's a bunch of stuff that's feeding their flesh. They saw somebody else had something. They saw somebody got a new car. They saw somebody got this amount of money. They saw somebody went on this vacation. And because they saw it in somebody else's life, now they desire it for their own. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And when we do this, all of a sudden, stuff appears on a vision board. Let me tell you something. That's not vision. Vision is something that God gives you. 
Vision is something that God speaks into your life after you have spent time in the presence of God. Scripture lets us know in the 127th Psalm, verse number one, it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman, there it is, waketh but in vain. See, if we don't take the time to get vision from God and we give ourselves vision our efforts are futile because if God didn't give it to us, God's not obligated to bless it. He's not obligated to sustain it. And that's why it's so critical that the visions that we get from God, we write them down and we act on those and that we are intent about not giving ourselves vision according to our natural desires or according to our own lust. See, what you got to understand is this vision that God gave Habakkuk it, it wasn't a very exotic vision. It, it, it wasn't anything that you get all excited about. No, when God told him to write the vision, the vision was is that God is going to use the Chaldeans to punish the people of God, but God in turn is going to punish the Chaldeans. And that the deliverance that is going to come to the people, it's going to come after a period of time. So the vision that God has given Habakkuk, he's like telling the people, hold on, change is coming. That is the vision. It, it wasn't a vision that God's going to bless them with a new house and a, lu and a luxury car. Mm -mm. The vision was hold on to your faith because you're in a challenging situation and even worse times are coming. But God's trying to encourage the people, hold on through it all because I'm God. I love you. My grace is sufficient. That's the vision. Now put that on a vision board. <laughs> That's, that, that, that's what's so amazing about this is that when you read scripture and you take time and allow God to feed your faith, God's word will ground us. It, it, it'll settle the matters of our heart and it really help us put things into focus as far as what's really important in life. So scripture, so, so God told Habakkuk, he said, write the vision and then he told him to write it on tables. Okay, that word that is used for tables right there is the exact same word when God spoke to Moses and said, go get tables so that he can write down the Ten Commandments. Now, that just further alludes to the fact that what God is getting ready to give Habakkuk needs to be read and then read again. Because just like the Mosaic law was written down so that it can form eventually what the Jews took as the Pentateuch, he needed to write, we, Habakkuk needs to write down the vision of God so that while the, the, the people of Judah are going through this Babylonian captivity, they can, they can read the vision and that the vision can in turn continue to feed their faith. So he told him, write it on the tables and I'm going to conclude that these are tables of stone. You know, different people draw different conclusions, whether it was tables of steel or, you know, tables of clay or whatever. I'm going to conclude tables of stone because the tables of the Ten Commandments were tables of stone. They were hewn out of a rock of a mountain. So I'm going to draw that, that parallel right there. But listen, listen what scripture says. I, I want you to catch this. In verse number two, in the latter part of verse number two, it says that he may run that readeth it. That that he may run that readeth it. You you know, the act of running is is a, is a prophetic act. That's running is something that prophets do, and I'll prove it to you because in Jeremiah chapter twenty three, I think it's somewhere around verse number twenty one. It God talked to, through Jeremiah, and he's talked about prophets. He said, "I did not send them, but they did run." So in other words, when God gives revelation to a prophet, they in turn take that word and they run with it. These particular prophets were false prophets. They gave themselves a word and then they began to run with it. But either way it goes, it's painting a very clear picture that running with the vision of God is a prophetic act. Now look at what God told Habakkuk. He said, write the vision down on tables. He said, make it clear. Why? So that any and everybody can understand it. Why? Because it's not going to be just Habakkuk that is going to run with the message, but anybody that reads the message, they in turn are going to become the prophet of God. You've got to get this. 
They are going to take the vision. They're going to take the word of God and they're going to put it in their mouths and they are going to begin to declare the revelation of God and they in turn will run. I, I, I pray this is blessing somebody. I want you to understand that that prophetic, it, it has two dimensions. There's a revelation, but then there's also a declaration. And sometimes you are operating in the prophetic by simply declaring the, the, the vision of God, declaring the revelation of God, even if it didn't directly come to you initially. Now, see, that should demystify a lot of all this prophetic stuff that's going on because the truth of the matter is when you stand before people and you tell people they need to repent, and get their life right because Jesus is a soon coming king, that is a prophecy. That is a, de is a declaration of things that are, you, you are running with the word at that point. Amen. The second coming of Jesus Christ is yet to come. But according to your faith in the word of God, you are running with the word of knowledge. You understand, you see how that works? So God is telling Habakkuk, he's telling him, write this down on tables of stone because look, this word has to outlast you. It's got to go further than your reach. It's got to, it's got to reach beyond your breath because when you write it down, then other people are going to receive this vision and they in turn are going to begin to run with it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So one thing that is made clear through verse number three is that time is always attached to prophecy. Whenever a prophetic word is given, there's always a specific point in time that God intended for that prophecy to be connected to, whether it's a start time and an end time, or whether it's just a specific point in time, you know, some scholars even write that God gave us time in order to measure prophecy because the two always work hand in hand. If you look in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10, God gave Jeremiah the very distinct time frame and said that the Babylonian captivity was to last 70 years. Now, he didn't tell Habakkuk that it was going to last 70 years. He just said that it's for an appointed time, that it's going to have a start date and that in the end it would speak and that it would not lie. So this is the vision that he's given Habakkuk and letting them know that the captivity was for a particular time, but that after that time frame was up, that the Chaldeans in, in turn would be punished and they would be conquered and that the Jews in turn would be, uh, would be freed under the, under the Persian rule. So it, it's very clear that God uses time to measure our faith. I, th I think that that's something that we have to receive and understand as believers. You know, we would love to not have to wait on things when it came to God. We, we would love that immediately after we believe God, that God in turn would just immediately move. But there are countless examples in scripture to where people were waiting on God and believing God for an, an immediate response or an immediate blessing. And things didn't happen in the time frame that they expected. The, the, my favorite one is Lazarus. If you read in John chapter 11, scripture talks about that Lazarus was sick and he was sick to the point of death. And it said that Lazarus' sister sent word to Jesus who was in another city, letting him know Lazarus, the one whom you love, is sick to the point of death. And what I love about it is that Jesus said that this sickness is not unto death. And scripture says that he stayed in the city two more days. <laughs> it's something that when we pray to God and we ask God to come into our situation, God intervenes, stop, start moving on, my, on our behalf, that God doesn't just immediately jump and acquiesce or just respond to our petition. Scripture says that he stayed two more days. You know, Habakkuk 2 and 3, it says that though the vision tarry, that, that word tarry, it means to walk slow. <laughs> I can imagine Lazarus sitting in his bed, being sick, maybe knowing that Jesus is on the way, maybe knowing that word had been sent out and it just feels like Jesus is walking slow. 
it, it feels like the response is coming, but it's not coming fast enough. And you know, many of us can identify with that. Many of us have visions. We have revelations. We have things that God has given us, things that God has spoken in our lives. And we're believing God for him to do it now. I'm believing God that he's going to do it. And my faith tells me I, I should be able to receive it now. But it seems like sometimes God is walking slow. He says, though the vision tarry, our posture as believers is to wait on the Lord. You know, we serve a God that's eternal. We serve a God that's everlasting. That means we may be bound by time, but God is not bound by time. And so often it's true that God doesn't operate within the confines of our expectation when it comes to time. You know, something that I read a while back in the book of Exodus, it talks about that when Moses went into the mountain, Mount Sinai, to go get the Ten Commandments, it says that he was up there for 40 days. And he was up there for so long that the children of Israel began to lose faith that he would come back. It says that he had delayed in his coming. And that word delay, when it says that he delayed in his coming, it actually means, it means to shame. It means to embarrass. You know, sometimes when we're expecting God to move, we, we are in a position where we feel vulnerable. We're in a position where we feel exposed. We feel naked and we're like, God, I need you to come rescue me. And it seems like God is walking slow, but I want to encourage somebody and let you know that God's got you. The vision that God has given you, it is for an appointed time. And the hope that we have in his word is that when God shows up, God showed up to Bethany. And even though Lazarus had passed away, Scripture says that he went to the grave where he was buried and called him back to life. You know, God's got a way of working miracles and God can work out situations in ways that we would never expect. See, that's why we want God to move within a certain time frame, because we're expecting God to move in ways that we've seen. But the truth of the matter is, is that God's got all power and God has the ability to do things that we haven't seen. He's got the ability to move in ways that we're, we're not even anticipating. So all we have to do as believers, it's easier said than done. But he said, wait on the Lord, though the vision tarry, wait for it, because in the end, at the end of this appointed time, it's going to speak to you and it's not going to lie. Behold. His soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathered unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. So God is beginning at this point to pronounce his judgments on the Chaldeans saying that even though I'm using them to punish the Jews at this time, he's turning around and beginning to pronounce the woes. And it actually begins in verse number four because he talks about how the Chaldeans are prideful when it says that he's lifted up. That means that they are prideful and that they are arrogant. And we know that that posture is just, it's one that God despises. Scripture says that he resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So this God, God, whenever God sees a proud spirit, that that's something that turns God off completely. And that is something that's very characteristic of these Chaldean people. And it's, and we're going to go into some more characteristics of their, of their posture, if you will, in verse number five, but verse number four ends in something that is, it says the just shall live by faith or the just shall live by his faith. Now understand Though Habakkuk is not mentioned anywhere else in scripture, this verse is repeated three other times in scripture. So he may not have been mentioned, but his words are used. Uh, two of them were used by Paul in Romans chapter one, verse 17. He says the just shall live by faith. And then he says the same thing in Galatians chapter three. Interestingly enough, those two occasions are talking about saving faith. Uh, Paul does something very interesting in Galatians 3, he's talking about how we're not saved by works, but we are saved, but the just shall live by faith. 
And, and, and when we say that the just shall live by faith, it's actually better interpreted by saying faithfulness, meaning that when you're going to live by faith, it means that you are going to act according to the word and the will of God. You are going to be faithful and that is what's going to identify you as just. Your works may not save you, but you are not excused from the responsibility of walking out the word of God. You know, Paul was very clear about that. He was very clear to let you know your works don't save you, but that doesn't excuse you from righteous living. Shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound, God forbid. So the expectation is still that you are faithful in the things of God. But then in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews also quotes this text in, in, in chapter 10, where it talks about the just shall live by faith. And they go a little bit further and not only talking about saving faith, but it's talking about enduring faith, particularly through persecution, because that was the whole message of the book of Hebrews. It's, it's talking to an early Christian church that's experiencing a lot of persecution, and it's trying to encourage people to hold on to their faith in the midst of all this opposition. So then the writer of Hebrews in chapter number 10, he's saying, we are not of those that draw back unto the position. Uh, to perdition, but we believe to the saving of our souls. So that's what he's saying that when he's saying in verse number 37, that the just live by faith or by faithfulness, he's saying that the way that you're going to hold on or endure with your saving faith is by living in your faithfulness. It is such a powerful scripture because it's, it's giving us something to identify us wholly as believers that how do we live this life? How do I endure hard times? How, how do I wait on God? What is my posture while I'm waiting for the vision, while I'm reading the vision, while I'm, I'm believing God for the revelation? What do I do? I live by faithfulness. I am faithful to the things of God. You know, and sometimes that is the temptation to pull away from the things of God. Sometimes when we go through hard times, sometimes when people go through challenging times in life, that's the times when sometimes they may stop showing up to the house of God. But those are the times you've got to lean into the things of God that just live by their faithfulness. And that is evident that God is going to give you strength to endure those challenging times. Now in verse number five, it goes deeper and explains how these Chaldeans are uh, are. are are carrying on. They, they transgress by wine. We talked about that earlier, that they were hedonists and they just did whatever. They lived according to the pleasure principle. You know, whatever felt good to their flesh. It says again that they're proud, neither keep at home. That means that they're always gone. They're, they're always busy doing something and involved in something that is wicked. It says, who enlarges his desire as hell and is as death. We know that death is an all-consuming force and that it never stops. It's not going to stop until the final judgment. Death is just a continual, and hell is a place that is continually growing. So that, so it's comparing the Chaldeans to that in effect and saying that just as hell is always growing and death is always consuming, these Chaldean people are always going and they're just never satisfied. But it says it gathered unto him all nations and heap unto him all, all people. That means that the Chaldeans are conquering people and taking territory that doesn't belong to them and that God in fact never intended for them. But we know the end of the story. We know that the Chaldean of the Babylonian empire was actually a very short-lived empire, only lasted about 75 years. Uh, they, they, they usurped authority and right at the end of the Assyrian Empire, there was like an Assyrian-Egyptian transition in this territory. The Babylonians took it over. And then in 539 BC, we know that the Persians came in and took over the Babylonians. And that was the end of the empire. So God's judgment, his vision did in fact come to pass. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string instruments. So in the latter part of the third chapter in Habakkuk, 
Habakkuk is showing how he's come full circle at this point. At the beginning of the book, he was questioning God. God was responding. He was continuing to question God. And then he finally received the word of God and declared that I will stand as a watchman and that he was saying, I'm ready to receive the word. God spoke the word. And then in chapter three, he spends time just really declaring who God is, you know, and that that is great guidance for us as believers that when we're going through challenging times, one of the best things we can do is remind ourselves of who God is, remind ourselves of the things that, that God has done, not in just in our lives, but, but through all creation. And he was just declaring the glory of God, declaring the judgment of God, declaring the power of God and saying, God, I know that you're this. God, I know that you're that. And if God, if you are all of these things and these, this word that you've given me, it, it will happen. Now he's doing something so important in verse number 17 because he's showing that even though I'm going to go through challenging times, even though we're going to experience drought and devastation and lack, he's talking about all these different elements. He's saying, I'm still going to trust God. So he's talking about vegetation when he talks about the fig tree and the fruit and the olive. He's saying that they're not going to blossom. They're not going to yield anything. It's talking about how there's going to be a lack of meat and that, um, that the uh, the flocks will be cut off from the fold and that there will be no herd in the stalls. He's just, he's just saying, we're going to experience all these things under the Babylonian captivity. And how am I going to sustain myself? Well, I'm going to have a posture of praise. He said, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and the God of my salvation. You know, and it, it, it very reminiscent of James chapter one, verse two, or maybe James is reminiscent of Habakkuk, but when scripture says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Look, what you're going through, you're going through for a reason, but the vision is for an appointed time. What you're going through is for a season. And that's what he's trying to remind himself of. And he's just going to praise God while he's going through it. He's going to joy in the God of his salvation. He's declaring faith. And I think that that's so important because when we talk about questioning God, sometimes it's always important that we just keep God high and lifted up and we keep God in the position that God is. I will rejoice in the, in the Lord, in the God of my salvation. And he says, the Lord God is my strength. He's telling God who he is to him at this point. This is, this is how you endure hard times. But then he makes a very interesting uh, metaphor when he says that you will make my feet like hind's feet. Most translations will say deer or it'll give some type of uh, interpretation to talking about deer. And, and it's interesting because when you think of a deer, you usually think of strength, you usually think of speed, but what I want you to really grasp from what he's saying is, is, is he's saying you're making my feet like hind's feet. It's going to be accurate or it's going to be sure. It's, it's sure footing. See, if you think about not, maybe not deer, but mountain goats or, or mountains, uh, sheep, you know, there's, there's a particular type of mountain goat. I think it's called an Ibex or something like that. Uh, it, they're able to climb really steep and really shallow mountains. And when you look at them and they're, and they're climbing these, these mountains, you're wondering like, first of all, who can climb these types of mountains and how are, how is a four hooved animal like that able to climb these types of, of, of slippery slopes, if you will. And it's talking about how God will make his feet like hinds feet, like these ibexes that are able to climb. So he's saying that you're going to make my footing sure. And even though I'm in challenging, difficult situations, God, you're going to give me the footing so I don't fall. You know, we all can identify with this. You know, it's something that I pray gives us all encouragement when we go through challenging times because sometimes we're in high places. Sometimes we're in terrain that's that's difficult to navigate. And sometimes we're going through, you know, fear and depression and anxiety and, and sometimes hopelessness and just despair. You know, I pray in those moments that God makes your feet 
like hind's feet and when when you feel like you're just going to give out when you feel like you're going to fall into a place of desperation god can give you strength you can glory in the god of your salvation because the the blessedness is to know that when you go through you're not going through alone but god is going with you in what you're going through it's for an appointed time i want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of just teach our goal here is to simply encourage as many people as we can in the Word of God and certainly to spread the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. We're asking you to support us in this effort by liking, by sharing, by subscribing, and certainly leave your comments in the comment section if you have any questions around the lesson. And if you have any prayer requests, we want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. Listen, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time.